Good morning. My name is Tamara Holmes and I'm from the great Commonwealth of Virginia where I have the great pleasure of serving as the policy director for the Department of Housing and Community Development as well as the Virginia ARC program manager. Like the, like the rest of Appalachia, Virginia's Appalachian region has experienced hardship due to loss of jobs in rail, textiles, furniture, and coal industries. So like the rest of the region, we've had to reassess our local economies and develop economic development strategies. In Virginia, we focus on our cultural and natural assets, and we do something called asset-based development, which I'm pretty sure everyone in the room is very familiar with. Using a multitude of state and federal resources, including the App Appalachian Regional Commission program, we are revitalizing our downtown communities, like the towns of Damascus, Cleveland, and Dungannon, preserving, developing, and promoting our natural and cultural assets through organizations like Hartwood, which is the Southwest Virginia Artists and Gateway, the Cricket Road, Round the Mountain, and Southwest, um, excuse me, and the Clinch River Valley Initiative. We're also building strong entrepreneurial economies through the My Southwest Opportunity Challenge, Community Business Launch, by cultivating, supporting, and expanding entrepreneurship and small business development. Southwest Virginia is in the process of branding our region, where people can live, work, and play. And as a result, in 2014, we had regenerated $971 million from visitors through Southwest Virginia. In the last decade, we've seen an increase in over 50% of visitors to our region and actually been able to generate $4.6 million in tax revenue in 2014 alone. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from three panelists who are investing in entrepreneurs and developing small businesses throughout the Appalachian region. We have with us Jill Van Beek, who's with Launch Tennessee. We also have Dr. Devin Stevenson, who's the president of Big Sandy Community and Technical College, and Joseph Colucci from West Virginia Small Business Development Center, who serves as a business coach for the New River, George, Develop Authority, and the West Virginia Hive. Just to give you a brief bio of each one of our panelists, Jill actually serves as the director of entrepreneurship and innovation, where she works to maximize opportunities for Tennessee entrepreneurs by building statewide and national network of mentors, customers, investors, and other resources. Jill graduated from Columbia University with a degree in urban studies, concentrating in economics and anthropology. Good morning. I think according to your agenda, you're expecting to see Charlie Brock here, who is our CEO, and he sends his very sincere apologies. He would like to be here rather than where he is today, but for uh, a health issue that will resolve itself, um, uh, he's not able to be here, and so I'm excited to be. Uh, I see a lot of friends and partners in the room, so uh, I, feel, I feel welcome. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk just for a second about Launch Tennessee and then dive into what I think is a bit more relevant to folks in this room with respect to what is happening at the community level uh, in some of our Tennessee cities. So Launch Tennessee is a uh, statewide public-private partnership and our capabilities are really embedded in our people, our partnerships, and the collaborations that we support and generate. And as I mentioned, some of the folks that are uh, integral to all of that are sitting here in the room. And I did want to point out my, my teammate, uh, Brittany Burgess, who uh, works with me at launch. So when we struggle in those areas of people or partnerships or collaborations, we really struggle in delivering impactful programming. And we work in communities that reflect the same situation. When those who succeed, they have strong leadership, they have vision, they have creativity, and they have energy. And they have partnerships that breed new resources, and they enjoy collaborations that pull multiple stakeholder groups into the fold. Their efforts are locally driven and very specific to that community. So those are the themes that I hope resonate with you as I present these slides. Uh, really, people, partnerships, and collaborations are key. So the story of Chattanooga is a living example of a community that has transformed itself because of its people, partnerships, and collaborations. And we're lucky actually to have three people who are fundamental to a lot of what you'll see on these slides here in the audience. And there may be more of you, I'm sorry, but I just saw Tia, Allison, and Enoch. So thank you guys for being here, and they are your source for Q&A later. So the Chattanooga of today is not the Chattanooga of yesterday. 
The story of Chattanooga is really all about community-based leadership that's building partnerships from previously untapped resources and, and uh, embracing collaborations with stakeholders that have never been in the game before. So we're going to start in 1969, and we'll go quickly. And if Charlie were here, he would have started in like 1900, because that's when his family uh, found its roots in Chattanooga. So you're welcome that it's me and not him. But in 1969, Walter Cronkite made a comment that Chattanooga is the dirtiest city in America. And it was really a wake-up call for the city's business and philanthropic and government leaders. The city's factory and founders, uh, I'm sorry, factories and foundries that had created a lot of jobs there had created an increasingly unlivable situation. So throughout the 70s and 80s, civic attention was really turned to the restoration of the physical environment in and around the city. So this was really when Chattanooga's public-private partnerships began to drive sort of inspiring and innovative new eras of collaboration. So as the air and water were cleaning up, it was evident that the community needed to come together for a new vision of Chattanooga, and they really took that idea of the community coming together very, very seriously. And those, the conversations generated some interesting activity. So the waterfront was really a, um, a, a very obvious, visible symbol of where these efforts had taken hold. Uh, the downtown core and riverfront area ended up with hundreds of millions of dollars invested in downtown parks and trails, museums, and public spaces. The aquarium featured here in the middle with the, I'll call it funky roof because I'm not an architect. Um, it was completed in 1992 and has since had another expansion in 2005. But to be an economically healthy city, you need more than just having beautiful places and fun activities for families. You need to have opportunity. So thanks to a lot of collaborations around the state and in the region, we're going to fast forward to 2008 when Chattanooga scored some huge wins with job creating capital investment intensive projects that are featured here with logos you guys probably all recognize. These were enormously impactful for the region, but what about entrepreneurship? So 2008 was key to answering that question. An initiative called Create Here was aimed at keeping talented, creative people in Chattanooga by strategically allocating resources to support their living and working and building businesses around their creativity. Create Here really turned the nonprofit formula on its head. Instead of raising money from individuals and giving them to organizations and groups, they flipped that model and raised money from institutions in the community and gave them to individuals. Now, the amounts of the grants were not big and there actually weren't a significant number of projects, but the key was is that the projects that did happen were very visible to other artists. Those artists became entrepreneurs and they stayed in Chattanooga to do it, and more and more people saw that success and saw that pathway. So the next, oh, it's right here too. Sorry, I didn't realize my slides were right here. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so in 2009, this was really the next step, Innovate Here. The Innovate Here initiative, the scale got bigger, but the themes were consistent with Create Here. Community leadership was very intentional with dedicating resources to a specific, un maybe unserved or at least underserved market. And the model was new to Chattanooga, but the key here is that a group of people pursued the resources to make it happen. They went outside the box. So you can see some of the criteria of the program. They offered lease subsidies and forgivable loans to convince entrepreneurs to build their businesses along Main Street. So they were creating a very specific place and helping the businesses uh, thrive there. So moving ahead another year, 2010, Momentum was building in Chattanooga, and more and more folks wanted to get involved. So Company Lab, or CoLab, was born 2010. The three elements of significance that I want to point out here is that in this virtual world that we live in, a physical meeting place is still critical. And CoLab served as one of the early homes for entrepreneurs, an early front door. Now there are many. CoLab was one of the first. The second point I want to make is that Early adopters of supporting entrepreneurs, those who were willing to think outside the box in those earlier days, had a place now to put their resources, whether it was financial, mentoring expertise, et cetera. These pioneers were part of a much larger pool now. And the third piece is that with that place and those resources, impactful programmatic support was developed, serving entrepreneurs in different stages, different sectors, different degrees of experience, different demographics. And the logos you see here are some of the programming that I'm referring to. 
2011 was a milestone year for Chattanooga. This is the year Chattanooga became the gig city. And what happened is that the community-owned electric utility, EPB, built a network that enabled the city to be the first gigabit city in the US. This incredible community asset transformed the city into a sandbox for entrepreneurs to discover what happens when bandwidth is no issue. Dozens of organizations, public and private, are officially supporting the exploration of what is next. And especially, that's especially important because now the gig is now 10 gigs and the network's been expanded. With the gig, one way that the gig was engaged in the, with the entrepreneurial space is when CoLab kicked off its first official accelerator program in May of 2012 called Gig Tank. Eight entrepreneurial teams came from across the US. They moved to Chattanooga for the summer to participate in this experience. Mentors, advisors, investors, and every resource you can think of really coalesced around these teams and it became a huge community effort. It really mobilized the community around how everyone, no matter what their skill set or expertise, could do to support entrepreneurship. And in August of that year, when Banyan, who you see pictured here, and, and there's Charlie, uh, won a $100,000 prize in front of a demo day, demo day audience of more than 400 people. So you're starting to see the community really start to, uh, to congregate around this effort. One of the more impactful programs uh, for Chattanooga actually came out of one of the uh, it was developed during one of the business planning programs that I showed you earlier, and it's co-starters. And Enoch is here in the room and can speak volumes to this program. Uh, but it was designed as a business development program for lifestyle companies or those with a local focus. What excites us at launch about this program is how customizable it is, if that's a word, for different stakeholder groups. And we have seen that happen in rural communities, for researchers at universities, high schools, veterans. There was a pilot done with a Girl Scout troop because selling cookies is one of the most fun forms of entrepreneurship, at least for those that buy them. And we, we've been amazed at the uh, economic impact of this program. And we're currently licensing, I'm sorry, not we, but the co-starters team is currently licensing the program around the state, the ARC region, and the US. And I know that some of the licensees are here in this room and can probably share some really interesting experiences about how they're using that curriculum. So another ingredient that communities need to support entrepreneurship is access to capital. And in 2010, Chattanooga's investment landscape was basically a goose egg. There were uh, investors that were participating in deals, but there was no organization of it. You had to be in the know. There was really no structure. And fast forward to 2015, and Chattanooga has six funds that make about $40 million available to entrepreneurs. Each of these funds has a different investment thesis. As an example, the Jump Fund invests in female founders only. Um, Lamppost Group is also a, an incubator for those companies, and so they offer a, a lot of services behind that. But you're starting to see that across the landscape in terms of different industry sectors, different stages of companies, you're starting to see access to capital be a resource that's available. All of these funds were um, designed um, by community leaders and, uh, and Chattanooga money. So fast forward to now to the Chattanooga today. Fully developed, the innovation district, and you can see some real photos and also some, some renderings there. It'll be a catalytic mix of startup businesses, incubators, accelerators, and other innovation generators. It's about 140 acres in the core of downtown. Getting back to, in this virtual world, a sense of place is so important. Ch Chattanooga is, re is recognizing that in spades. The anchor of the Innovation District is the Edney Building, which you see here. It's a 90,000 square foot, 10 story building that houses innovative office spaces, community event spaces, shared accelerator spaces, and CoLab recently relocated there. The Innovation District, and this gets to the, the uh, multi-use and multi-party partnerships, but the, uh, the Innovation District is also home to many public and private groups. EPB, the utility that put the gig network in, part of the University of Tennessee Chattanooga is located there, the Public Library, Lamppost Group, Coyote Logistics, Bell Hops, Causeway Society of Work, Arts Build, on and on and on and on. Creating density in one place fosters an amazing amount of innovation and creativity. So what all of these communities have in common across the state of Tennessee, and I hope I demonstrate a little bit of this in Chattanooga, is that they have people and organizations that have varying degrees of resources available to them. 
The challenge and the opportunity is in aligning those people to then form partnerships to draw out new resources that their entrepreneurs need. That's the end of my show. Sorry, I'm a little technologically challenged. As Jill said, there's a monitor here. All right, so our next panelist is Dr. Devin Stevenson, who is the president of San Big Sandy Community and Technical College. He's a Summerton, Alabama, I hope I pronounced that right if I didn't tell me. Summerton, Alabama native, Dr. Stevenson has over 40 years of experience in higher education. He's previously served as the president and CEO of Three Rivers College in Missouri prior to coming to Big Sandy and has held numerous leadership positions within the Alabama Community College <laughs> system, including vice president of external affairs and dean of students at Belleville State Community College CEO of Sneed State Community College and Dean of Students at Walker State Technical College. He is also a community college graduate. He earned an associate's degree in science from Walker Junior College, followed by a BA in business administration from Birmingham Southern College, and both master's and doctoral degrees in administration of higher ed from University of Alabama. Dr. Stevenson and his wife, Judy, reside in Paintsville. They have two adult children, John and Julianne. Please welcome Dr. Stevenson. Thank you very much. I just have to say roll tide. <laughs> I told my family I wanted to do that one time in Tennessee. Just one time. And I apologize for Lane Kiffin. I, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. Uh, where are my Kentucky peeps out there? Kent Ooh. Yeah. All right. Go Big Blue. Uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, today to talk to you about the work that we're doing uh, in eastern Kentucky. We're in the easternmost part of the state, uh, and great things are happening in a really uh, tough time. These are challenging times for us. Let me give you a quick little history and set the stage, and then I'll tell you what we're doing with entrepreneurship and really making changes in the lives of people there. Our institution uh, is sort of a blend, a consolidation of two. Uh, Mayo Technical College is the oldest technical college in the state of Kentucky. It started in 1938. Um, it has a lot of history, including a 1964 visit by uh, President Lyndon Johnson on the day that he declared the war on poverty. He did it in eastern Kentucky on the front steps of uh, our Mayo campus. Uh, and then Prestonsburg Community College uh, started in 1964 as just a junior college. And then in 2003, these two came together. And the reason I put the sign up, uh, there's two there. Someone said, do you really want two on there? Uh, it has been so darn hot in Kentucky, I wanted to remind myself of what snow looked like. <laughs> and so I put the spring sign and then uh, the, the winter sign. You know, we're all that way. It'll, it snowed 18 inches in 24 hours in Kentucky. Uh, I prayed that day for the summer to come. And every day of the summer, I prayed for that 18-inch snow to come back. Um, but our institution serves about 10,000 students annually. We're located in the five counties that are in the most eastern part um, of, the, uh, of the state of Kentucky. Four of those counties have a 12.5% unemployment rate, and McGoffin County has a 22.5% unemployment rate. Our challenges are great. We've gone from 28,000 to 6,000 coal jobs and now we're down to just very, very few operators at all, and it has impacted every sector, every area of the economy of, uh, of Eastern Kentucky. But I'm proud to tell you, we are making progress. Uh, this past year, our college awarded over 1,600 uh, degrees, diplomas, and industry-recognized credentials. In fact, our career education programs are doing some amazing work. They are soaring. <laughs> 
Uh, and we're really glad to have Jared Arnett with us today. Many of you have heard about shaping our Appalachian region, SOAR. And Jared Arnett, who's executive director, is back there. And Jared, I appreciate you being here. But um, we also have licensure and certification rates that are rivaling any Kentucky institution, and, and I'm really proud. When I first got to Kentucky a year and four months ago from my work in Missouri, I really asked myself the first few days what I had gotten myself into. It was serious. And the word fear came up, and I realized I had a couple of choices. And that was either fear everything and run, or I could, as a leader, one that the college and the community depended on, I could face everything and we could rise. And I chose the second part of that. I chose the part of facing the issue and doing good things. Uh, by the way, if you want a copy of this PowerPoint, and there are some salient quotes in here, uh, if you'll see Josh Ball down front, um, uh, he will, and give him your uh, uh, card, uh, we will get you uh, this presentation. So what I realized up front is that I could not approach the leadership of this institution as I had in other ways, that for the most part throughout my career, I've tried to solve problems in a one-dimensional plane. And that was looking at it on top and on bottom and trying to solve it. Some people say you solve problems by getting outside the box. And I'm going to tell you, in eastern Kentucky, you can't even get outside the box. But to be an effective leader, what you have to do is be a geometric thinker. And that is, you have to be able to plan from all angles and solve problems by degrees. And I thought, how could I show, how could I demonstrate that? And I remembered years ago when the specialty companies would send these little devices that would sit on our desk and it would have the calendar on it. They were pop-ups like this. You remember them? And it reminded me that the work that we do now in leadership in changing the culture is one that requires geometric thinking. And I can't solve problems like this anymore. I have to solve problems by looking at things from a different direction. Sometimes I have to turn it over and look at it at the bottom, some from the side. But generally, there's always a solution to the problem if I look at it angularly and not in one dimension. And so at the institution then, I challenged our leadership team to look at possibilities and not problems, look at opportunities and not obstacles and that's what we've done and we've literally taken on the idea that our institution has to be involved in three sectors of the work and that is community development economic development and workforce development and i will tell you i heard somebody earlier say uh, in the main session that you could not have workforce development without economic development and i would say to you colleagues and ladies and gentlemen you cannot have economic development without community development you are not going to bring in major industry. You are not going to make an impact unless the quality of life and the quality of place is where people want to come. That magnetizes them to your spot. So we've taken a direct uh, effort in improving the quality of life and what I call the quality of place. And we did that recently by partnering with the city of Prestonsburg, Kentucky. And we took over management of the Mountain Arts Center, which is the premier performing arts center uh, in eastern Kentucky. It is the home of the Kentucky Opry. And so the mayor and I sat down and talked about how could we leverage our resources? How could we do things that would really make neat things happen? Um, and so we uh, created a memorandum of understanding with uh, the city that also has a, a management fee that we're paid to manage the Mountain Arts Center, which is a major tourist attraction for our community, as well as a profit sharing clause on the end that incentivizes us to work harder to bring acts and to raise revenue. So we share in the profits as well, and sort of a neat kind of innovative entrepreneurial idea for our institution. So now as a college president, not only am I managing four campuses and multiple high school sites, but uh, we have the opportunity to manage the Mountain Arts Center, which is a very fine, fine uh, institution. One of the things that we did immediately was install public Wi-Fi, and uh, Josh uh, Ball, who is here today as our strategic communication director, started geofencing there. So every time groups, large groups come in and they pull up their smartphone devices, we promote and roll out all of the great things that are happening in the area in tourism, uh, in economic development, in higher education, through the geofencing methodology, and it works, works very well. In addition, we've taken a real interest in the historical and cultural um, assets of our region. And I bring three just to show you today because what we're trying to do is create an ecosystem 
that drives people to us. We believe Eastern Kentucky, which is, by the way, the home of the Hatfields and the McCoys, and I've met many of them, and they're pretty nice people. I'll just I'll tell you, they really are. Um, we are also the home of Highway 23, which is birthed Loretta Lynn, Chris Stapleton, uh, Patty Loveless, Crystal Gale, uh, Dwight Yoakam, Ricky Skaggs. So everybody that lives in a holler, where, whether they come out of the head or the mouth of the holler, they can either play or sing. And so we believe that cultural piece of what we do is really important as an institution. Someone has to get their head around that, and someone has to make the change. It's not going to happen on its own. So what we've decided to do is take on that ecosystem ourselves. We have several historians and archivists at the institution. Uh, we're negotiating right now on the John C.C. Mayo home. Many of you may know that name. John C.C. Mayo bought up all the mineral rights in eastern Kentucky. He was a very wealthy man, built his home in 1912 at a value of 250000 in today's money at $6 million. Uh, on the right side is a Sam May house. Sam was a senator and a philanthropist. That house was built in 1817, and we now have tours and provide uh, docents and internships in uh, that house for historical preservation. And then we're assisting Whalen, Kentucky, which is a really prominent coal camp in our area, um, to, restore, to restore itself into a health and wellness community and be part of a, a tour as well. So our institution is involved in community development. We are involved in economic development. But the thing that we're really proud of today and the thing that we bring to you is our work in boasting of the fiber uh, optics training that we're doing in Eastern Kentucky. And I see Benny Garland is here today. Benny is sort of the brainchild behind the fiber optics program that we began a year ago. We've trained 140 coal miners to splice, to test, and to lead in the, the form of fiber optic training, in very short term training. And within the next two months, we're building a state of the art advanced technology center in Pikeville, Kentucky where we do that training. This will be the only fiber to desk installation in the state of Kentucky, a LEED certified building, and we will ramp up our fiber optics program even beyond uh, this. The way we started is through simple stackable credentials. And uh, this next slide will show you sort of uh, how that works. There we go. So uh, as you can see, the very, the, you may not be able to actually read it, but the, but the bottom section talks about the very basic fiber optic training that we did. And then we stacked the credentials all the way up to an associate degree, and we're working with the University of Pikeville now to deliver a baccalaureate degree. But it's been amazing. It's been absolutely phenomenal to watch what has happened with training coal miners. And I'm going to give you three examples today. We have created uh, 140 entrepreneurs, but there are three I want to highlight. Fred Bentley, Charles Scarberry, uh, and Tyler Martin. All of these worked in the coal industry. Tyler was a surface miner. Fred and Charles uh, were underground miners. They went through the program. And within just a few weeks after they completed, they were hired by Verizon to do some West Coast work. And uh, the quality and the work ethic of coal miners is absolutely phenomenal. Most of you know they're, they're strongly dedicated, strong family values, uh, committed to excellence. And these, uh, Fred and Tyler, ended up in Texas working for Google Fiber, making $52 an hour, where they now install Google Fiber. They'll be coming back to Kentucky when the iWired Highway comes on board, and they will lead the installation of the Kentucky Fiber into our area. What's interesting, our topography is very mountainous, as you know, um, and 90% of the fiber is going to be uh, strung uh, on cabling rather than buried in the, in the ground, which makes it really interesting. As a result of, of this program, we extended and we not only stacked credentials, but some of you educators will recognize this language, we started latticing the, uh, the credentials. So now we have a lot of depth as we add, add that into these young entrepreneurs, but now we add width. So we now have lineman training, OSHA training, CDL training and fiber optics training molded together in a 12-week program and we fill that class up after one week of, an, of uh, announcing it and it will continue on because there's such a huge demand. In eastern Kentucky there's a technique in fiber called lashing. Some of you may have heard about it but because of the, the rough weather when they suspend the fiber to avoid having it stretch or break because of ice or snow they lash the fiber. And this particular program is the only program that we know about in the region that actually teaches lashing 
as a, as a part of that, that process. So uh, Kelly Hall is back there. Kelly's our Dean of Workforce Development. She's standing by the one and only Earl Gold back there. Um, and Kelly launched these programs, put them in place, and now we are training coal miners uh, to do great work. Uh, what is happening, they're becoming independent contractors. They're becoming young entrepreneurs. We had to teach them financial literacy, how to manage a business, how to do all of those things. It's been really, really interesting. And then we're going to move from here to cybersecurity and unmanned aircraft as a part of our program. We're really proud of others that have come through our program. Here's one, Danny Ratliff graduated in May and was accepted into pharmacy school. An underground coal miner will now move out and own his own business once he completes the school in Pikeville, Kentucky. This is the kind of work that we're doing and that we're promoting. And we believe it comes because of the partnerships that we develop. Also, as you know, uh, community colleges are very nimble. We're adaptable, we're connected, and we, uh, we know how to try to move and, man and maneuver. Next Tuesday, we open the most revolutionary thing that I've ever been a part of in my career. We open a coding academy. You can teach coal miners to code. And in this particular coal uh, academy, uh, we are doing a public-private partnership on the campus that Lyndon Johnson uh, visited in 1964. And we are bringing in 50 coal miners and coal miner families that have been impacted by the layoffs. And we begin this very high-level training with 50 of them in iOS and Android coding. It's a 20-week paid internship. They make $400 a week and it is funded through a wonderful project of ARC, through their power project, and uh, Earl, we are very grateful for that. Through EKSEP, 2.75 million will help fund this coding academy that will allow our miners through high-speed fiber to work from home, to work in our teleworks hub, to work in our makerspace right on campus. We're really excited, it launches, and we're expecting great things uh, to happen. You know, I, I am convinced that we have to think more microscopically. We do think regionally, but I know that great things happen where change and collaboration collide. And that's, that's the magic piece of this. Uh, we've taken adventurous steps. We have to continue to do that. We do that uh, with our friend um, uh, Jared Arnett with SOAR. Many of you have heard about SOAR. It has now become a real conduit. Uh, let's pass on that. We'll talk about that later. Um, that's our early college academy. We have a, 140 high school seniors that are on our campus full time. Uh, they come as juniors and they leave at the end of uh, the two years with both an associate degree and a high school diploma. And we're sending them to the University of Kentucky at the age of 18 as juniors. It's a pretty amazing program and we uh, waive all the tuition for those programs. Uh, I believe entrepreneurial leaders dwell on a canvas of innovation and fresh ideas and they effectively know how to blend colors and connect dots. And that's the difference in a higher ed leader now and one 15 years ago. I've had to completely reorient myself as to what a higher education leader is. It's more about resting on the 40-acre campus and just doing your thing. It's about lifting that 40-acre campus uh, out into the community and making a difference in people's lives. And that's exactly uh, what we're trying to do. Um, so the SOAR initiative is really important. These are four uh, of the SOAR community college presidents, um, and we have uh, been working very diligently with SOAR uh, to uh, upload a power grant that will help us advance this digital infrastructure that we're doing. I believe that we're focused on the right things, and that is transformation, change, and collaboration. I remember my little sainted grandmother. She said, Devin, always remember this. There are three constants in life, taxes, debt, and change. Those things will happen, just get ready. So you, you, know, you can get accustomed to them or not, but it's gonna happen in your life. So with one goal in mind, what we're trying to do is make our region a powerhouse of thoughts and ideas that translate into something that is tangible and revolutionary. And I really believe right now we have to seize control of our future and our destiny as we create the future. One student, one opportunity, one promise, one hope at a time. Thank you.
All right, so, so far we've learned about investments and initiatives in Kentucky and Tennessee. I've learned about the Mountain Arts Center having geofencing and the one gig available in Chattanooga. So as a parent of a preteen and teenagers, I know I can go to Tennessee and Kentucky to find Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now I'd like to welcome our next panelist, Joe Carlucci, who grew up in a small coal town in southern West Virginia called Glenn Daniels. His work, work experience includes everything from being a member of the elite presidential support unit in the U.S. Navy to developing an application that tests cell signals. He currently serves as the West Virginia Small Business Development Center business coach, serving seven counties in the southern part of West Virginia. He provides entrepreneur support that includes startup, growth, and exit stages in their business cycles. Assistance includes but, but is not limited to marketing, sales, financing, exporting, business strategy and development, and government contracting. Joe's duties also include being the founder and director of the West Virginia Hive Accelerator Network, which is a network of off flexible office and incubator space located in five counties throughout Southwest Virginia. These spaces include maker labs, coding labs, touchdown office space, and connect a host of resources, mentors, and technical advisors by coordinating these facilities and strategic <coughs> regional partners. Help me welcome Joe Carlucci. Thank you very much. Um, inspiring stuff, really. I mean, they have a history, they have a goal, a vision, and you know, now I'm gonna tell you a story of someone, this, this, this thing that just started. We're, we're fledgling, we're brand new. Um, and it, there, there's some challenges that come with that, but you know, to see the, the outcome of the, the tenacity and the, and, and the persistence of achieving that goal 10 years, 20 years down the line is, it's very inspiring. Um, we started the uh, West Virginia Hob Network uh, originally as a, as a co-working lab um, that, that actually blossomed in, into a much larger uh, idea in southern West Virginia. Um, I think you'll, you'll see some going themes here, uh, partnerships, community, people, collaboration, uh, public-private partnerships. These are all things that we have that we have to do as as Appalachians, because we have to we have to work more with less right now, you know. Uh, how do we get those people to boomerang back into our into our economy? Um, so we our our first pilot ship is uh, West is in uh, WBU in Beckley. We're launching five more of these, but we also have have about nine affiliate networks, and those are just referrals. So we're we're, we're uh, force multiplying everyone's resources. Um, we serve nine counties with a touch point of 239,000 people. Um, and these, you know, these are, these, are, these are counties that have been devastated by, by you know, the coal jobs, lack of coal jobs and, and uh, the attrition of rail, rail jobs as well. Um, and we started, I mean, I heard $40 million, I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, we started with $25,000. 25,000, okay, and we leveraged that thanks to, thanks to Earl and ARC to, uh, you know, in-kind services and also financial to $2.1 million in a year and a half. You know, it was, it was uh, you know, again, all the public-private partnerships, the collaborative, uh, the, the, the teaming, uh, that, that's all instrumental in making that happen. So we have, uh, again, community. You know, that is our core product. I think that's, that's, that's the theme in, in every single incubator that, that's in Appalachia right now is community. You have to have that buy-in uh, from, your, from your, your, your base in order to make this thing work. Um, how do we do that? You know, we, we offer pre-launch services, business resources, financing, mentoring. Um, so this is all new. So when you're, when you're trying to stand up an incubator, okay, <laughs> You have, there's a lot of information, but you just have to kind of see through it because you, you can't be New York, you can't be California, you're in, you're in Southern Appalachia and in the coal fields. So things that are already put in place like Enix um, Coast Orders, um, this Inky Track system. You know, this, uh, I met this person in, in Christie's NBIA conference, National Business Innovation Conference. 
Um, these are all systems that are already in place. It's just a matter of adapting them to your region. Okay, customized programs to fit any stage of development. You don't want to you don't want to lock in people, you know, and say, "Oh, we're just a tech lab." You know, we're just a, a food lab. So we are a mixed use incubator, um, and we vet those people using co-starters first. It's an excellent, excellent uh, test for, for a rural economy. And like, like Jill, uh, and, and this, is, uh, this is versatile. You can use it on, uh, for Girl Scouts too. Um, and that's, so they have to prove a minimum, a minimum tested uh, product before they move on to the second course, which is where the money is. <laughs> uh, and the, the founder is connected to all the resources, um, and I'll go over that later, uh, and, and really coaching and mentoring and uh, investing in that, in that person's idea. Um, and mission criteria, very, it's not, you know, it's not a six page dissertation or a hundred page dissertation, it's very simple to achieve. We, uh, we model this off of uh, Growth Wheel, Lean Startup, and Business Model Canvas, okay? And this is, this is every critical component of any business, and that's how we're starting. You know, what are the fundamental parts, and then how can we expand on those? And then once they're ready, after 18, 36 months, we, we send them to scale up. So we get, they get $15,000 here, a forgivable loan, um, and then they get $30,000 here. As a business coach, what I've experienced is that you can't go the traditional, you can't go the traditional loan route when you're just starting something like this. Um, you can. Uh, but they're looking at FICO scores. They're not really looking at an idea. So that'll be kind of the phase two, and I hope we can get to, to where you guys are, you know, five, ten years from now. <coughs> but if you can see up here, nine weeks, 36 weeks, six to, or 36 to 42 months, six to 12 months. Stakeholders are inherently impatient. They're going to ask you, <laughs> you know, where are the jobs, you know? How much capital infusion did you, did, you, did, did you infuse into the economy today, right? Yeah, and to, to start this, you have to have that conversation that this is a, tr uh, a seed that you're planting, and you may never see the shade. That goes over well, you know, with the community. When someone's running for office, not so much. They want 100 jobs right away. Um, but you have to be prepared to have that conversation. Um, we have a, a digital design lab, wearables lab, code lab, mentors, five co-working incubation facilities, a maker lab, one button studio. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in talking to you, Dr. Devin. We are starting a, a brand, new, brand new system. We're actually gonna train uh, 10 middle school students in cybersecurity and start a business with that. And we're gonna peel, peel off, they're actually gonna have, generate income and we're gonna peel that off and put them into a, a, a scholarship fund. So they'll generate income out of middle school in a cybersecurity landscape, okay? Our broadband, very important, extremely important, something that we lack inherently in West Virginia, which is why, if you look back, we, we strategically located these, these incubators and these uh, co-working facilities within 30 miles of some of the, some of the you know, least broadband area. Um, that has that has that has that bandwidth, um, so that people can't touch down in those spots. Uh, Ray asked me. This is something that's that's new. Uh, we've asked for one social entrepreneurship coach. Okay. This is new and innovative. This is kind of untested. Um, we actually got a, a matching grant with the One Foundation for that, and this was a fight that I had as a business coach. You know, if you if if you see Social enterprises are businesses, okay? They have to get legally organized. They, they hire people, right? They generate revenue. Uh, Maybe may soft, soft funds, but they do generate, generate revenue. So Ray asked me to define what a social enterprise is. So I stole this from Mason. <laughs> uh, and it's really where your market uh, meets your margin and your mission, okay? So, you know, you can, have, you can have both. You can have a margin business and you can also have a mission business. And they both play in the market. Very good example of this is Tammy Jordan in um, Raynell, West Virginia. She started uh, Fruits of Labor, which is a bakery shop, you know. 
but she also has seeds of recovery, which um, trains a, you know addicted and people people that have been through the system how to how to cook. So she trades that. On. That's that's her mission side. Her margin side is the bakery, and they both they both play in the same market. So she uses one for the other. Um, something that that's new that we're gonna that we're gonna start um, with our first cohort. Uh, another another thing was that we, that we, we we were just kind of brainstorming was how many collision points can you start in your community? Okay, so it's very important to have buy-in from your community. It's very important for your community to be involved. Um, this is again brand new, so no one knows what you know. I've, I've heard oh we started an incubator in the '70s that never worked, <laughs> but now it's a new it's a it's a new innovative thing. It, you know entrepreneurship has this new sexy kind of appeal now. So uh, generating as many collision points between the community and entrepreneurs as possible, and that's with demo days, networking events. Um, we do this every first Monday of every month. We do this every the third Friday of every month. This is the second Thursday. This is once a, once a quarter. Um, startup weekends. So again, a fledgling incubator. This is, we're, we're trying to act as a catalyst for change right now. And a lot of that is just beating the street and marketing. Um, this is really important. Okay, again, want to, to reiterate, we have to do more with less in Appalachia. Um, so how do you do that? Right here, you have to map your landscape of your entrepreneurs, your entrepreneurial support support network. So your resource providers. This is every. This is these are all the other incubators in the state. You know, SBDC, Launch Lab, NBIA. Christy, <laughs> I've learned a considerable amount. If you guys are thinking about starting an incubator, NBIA is a phenomenal resource to go to. These are the, the and they have incubator managers from Ghana to China in this place that you can just, you know, brain dump. Um, advocates and champions. This is, uh, we have about three or four economic development authorities that have partnered. Uh, you know, all the chambers are, are involved uh, and even a, a local kind of sub-chamber, the Downtown Beckley Business Association. This is important. You know, foundations are a, a critical component of, of a, a fledgling incubator. Um, like I said, we started with 25 grand. We 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 leveraged that to 2.1 million now, and we couldn't have done that without the help of ARC, um, Benedum Foundation, Beckley Area Foundation. You know, a lot of the philanthropic groups. Um, also, so, you know, NCIF Martin's here. Uh, they're they're a key partner of ours as well. Um, and then you know, SBA. SBA has grants and awards all the time. USDA, MACID. Uh, so leverage your resources. Uh, of course, workforce development. Jason should be in here somewhere. So re region one planning and development. I think region one, two, three, and four uh, were all critical components in, in putting this together. And then institutional based. Inst institutions um, pl play a huge role in this. You know, they're they're training our next our next uh, wave of leaders. So. Partnering with them and incorporating the entrepreneurship mindset inside of some of these degree programs, to where these the, these these young kids can, uh, you know, they don't have to leave. They can they can get out of college or do it while they're in college. Lessons learned. <laughs> this is these are some of the lessons we've learned along the way in this past 18 months. Okay, one lean on the experts. Um, if hindsight's always 2020, uh, Lisa and Russ back there, uh, IOTA, a phenomenal resource for, for feasibility studies and best practices. Um, of course, NBIA, when you're, when you're looking to actually just start. Um, expect some pushback and some levels of consent without expectations to participate, okay? And this is true in rural communities because you're, you're dealing with, you know, I don't know, a population of 15,000 people. You know, but those key influencers in that community need to participate. They can't give you an attaboy and hey, that's a great idea. You need to, you need to have them involved. Um, share resources, leverage strengths, shore up your weaknesses with your networks. I always go by the with them, right? What's in it for me? And when you approach your partners like that, how can 
my strengths shore up their weaknesses? And how can we leverage each other's, uh, leverage each other's resources for the greater good? Um, seed entrepreneurship according to your own ecosystem, okay? Uh, we don't have broad, we, we have very little broadband in, in West Virginia. So a data center and you want to be a one gig city, that's going to take a significant amount of push, right? So, you know, what, what does your ecosystem look like? You know, don't force it. Um, Lisa, Lisa told me. <laughs> uh, offer programs that have multiple collision points with the community. Buy-in, again, buy-in and participation are important when you're starting one of these, okay? They need to know that you're there. You know, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, I, I, I didn't even know you were here, you know? So that, that's really the, the first year, that first 18 months, that's the push, is just letting everybody know that you're there. Um, never quit. <laughs> you know, I think, I think, you know, we have a, I think Stephen was, Stephen and I were talking, um, you know, at probably once a week, you're just like, ah, God, this is so hard, you know? And you want to quit, but you can't, because, you know, you're there for a reason. Um, you're there to move that needle, and, and so in Appalachia, you can do that. I don't think you can do I've lived in D.C. for 16 years, but I'm running back to, to West Virginia. You can't do that anywhere else and, but, but Appalachia, because our, you know, our legislators are, are accessible. Our leaders are uh, amenable to any idea. Um, so you can move the needle if you want to. And support systems are important. Um, hopefully, this is a great networking event for for, for all of us, and you know, I'm, I'm available. My my, my num number and name is on the card, or you know, feel free to call me on my cell phone. Um, I'm sure most of our panel are, are, are the same way. Um, and if not, you can just you know, Facebook stalk us on the <laughs> on our website. That's 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 it. Thank you. So that concludes our panel, and we're now we're going to open up the question and answer session. All right, who's going to be the first one to? All right, we have a volunteer. Let's give our um, panelists a round of applause as I walk. Through. Thank you. I'm Rick Lane, the director of Career and Workforce Development at the Southeast Tennessee Development District in Chattanooga. This question is for Dr. Stevenson. I'm interested in a uh, follow-up on your coding academy. Uh, what kinds of jobs do you see those uh, individuals moving into once they complete the training? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. We'll answer it. Uh, some in advanced manufacturing. We also have tested the water with some coders that are working for Google and Amazon and other leading technology companies completely away. That's why it's so important that we get the Kentucky I wire in the area. Now we're bringing a hundred meg pipe to that coding academy, and we'll set up a, a maker space for those that complete. But we believe the telework type hub idea is for them, and they'll be telecommuters, working for companies, for transportation companies, logistics, those types of jobs. So most everyone that we train is going to become their own entrepreneur, their own independent contractor in that regard. They'll be self-starters and self-makers. Do we have any additional questions? Any additional questions in the room? Okay. I'm Jennifer Simon. I'm the director of the Innovation Center at Ohio University, and I had the good pleasure of meeting Joe and, um, and some of you during the power announcements. Um, one of the questions I had was for the Launch Tennessee work and what you've done and some of the, kind of the, in Chattanooga in particular, the um, massive amount of private investment that you had to leverage. Are there incentives that you've built in for angel investment, for some of those, you know, private development? I've, this new facility sounds amazing. The corridor sounds amazing. How are you incentivizing some of that activity? Well, I can speak to the, the lights on. Hello. Uh, I can speak to the angel investment comment, and then actually I'd love to turn to my friends in Chattanooga to speak specifically to some of the innovation district questions. But in terms of angel investment, the angel funds that were formed in Chattanooga were really 
community driven. Those were investors who believed that it was time to organize and structure those resources. In addition, we're pretty excited that our General Assembly last session passed an angel investor tax credit uh, that we will be able to start issuing January 1. So we'll actually be back up here in a couple weeks doing, uh, as part of our angel investor tax credit roadshow, um, talking to accredited investors. And really the idea there is we want to socialize the opportunity to pull even more people off the sidelines. There are a lot of financially capable people um, in Tennessee and throughout the ARC footprint who are not engaged in your entrepreneurial activities. And we feel like this is gonna be a tool in Tennessee to pull some of that, that wealth off the sidelines. In terms of Chattanooga, where'd she go? Allison. Allison Reedy is a, is a director at, uh, at CoLab in Chattanooga. Thank you, Jill. Um, so as far as the Innovation District and how that's been incentivized, um, the Innovation District is actually a city-led program. Um, so our mayor, um, it's one of his programs. Um, and then for the Innovation Building that we're actually located in, that was a Tennessee Valley Authority building. Um, they were downsizing some of their assets, so they sold that building to the city. Um, and then the city put out an RFP to private developers. Um, so it's actually private developers who have a very kind of structured contract on they need to have a co-working space, they need to have an incubator, they need to have, um, we actually have a really cool rooftop that was kind of in the contract. Um, and if they didn't complete those by certain timelines, there was um, some fees that they had to pay for that as well. So um, that's kind of how that's structured. I have additional questions. I'm Lewis Buck with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, and I just wanted to really make a comment and add to it because uh, our Commissioner of Agriculture provided a grant to our 4-H and FFA that we're sending FFA advisors and 4-H extension agents to CoLab, uh, what we call a Shark Tank style competition for our 4-H and FFA to push that teaching, and we call it, it's within our Ag Launch initiative under Launch Tennessee, but to push all this out more rural, and really we teach agriculture nationally as a science, not a business. Uh, and one of my eureka moments working with our 4-H curriculum on this, uh, any of you that know kids and most of us that grew up in either 4-H or FFA and gave a public speech in the fourth grade, you get over the fear of public speaking and you see the poise and confidence from then on. If we can teach uh, 4-H and FFAers to stand on their feet, because they do that in speeching, teach them a few more words to make a pitch. Uh, but the eureka moment, if that gets them over the fear of math, like it did public speaking, then we've got STEM going forward, which I hadn't even thought of. So we're pushing it out under launch, ag launch, and pushing it out to 4-H and FFA, which will be fun. And we'll send the first bunch down there to be trained up uh, Next month, I think. We have a question on top. This is for Dr. Stevenson. I'm uh, Mayor Trent, uh, Mayor of Moorhead, Kentucky. And with uh, Kentucky just surpassing California as the number two producer of uh, aerospace in, in the United States, and that's our number one. How do you see, you mentioned unmanned service, unmanned, uh, how do you see that uh, coming up in the future? And have you looked at ideas on how to incorporate that into what you're trying to do? Yes. Um, let me say, much like others have been quoted, I noticed there's a new car commercial that says it now, the best way to um, predict the future is to create it. That's exactly what we're doing. But we see um, drone technology for us in precision agriculture. That's where we're working now with a couple of West Virginia institutions. When I was in Missouri, we did a, a TAC grant for precision ag. It created an opportunity to do uh, drone surveillance for bl uh, blighted fields, and, and that's exactly what we think we have to do. Ultimately, what we have to do in eastern Kentucky is level the mountains, and so agriculture is one way we can do that, and uh, certainly the videography field and public relations field is big too, but precision agriculture is our focus on unmanned aircraft, and we're talking short-term certificates right now that lead right in directly to the job market. 
Yes, first of all, thank you for sharing. Um, my name is Jean Horseman. I work with a national social enterprise that grows established small employers in low in income communities across the country. So as you're thinking about the ecosystem of small business development and the stages of small business development, where are you seeing the types of programs that are specifically tailored to the needs of a business that survives startups? Remember, only about 80% of startups exist after five years, so that they can accelerate into second stage businesses and move into that 10 to 100 uh, person employee pools. I'll take it. So the model that we've seen, and there's no one model that works, and one of the blessings we have at launch is that with all of our community partners across the state, we get to see a lot of different versions and hopefully help them share some best practices and lessons learned. But in terms of, it's almost like the stacking of credentials, and I, I wrote that down because I like that phrase, in terms of stacking the support models for entrepreneurs so that there is a continuum of care, if you will, for entrepreneurs from idea stage through to, say, the public markets. Um, and each community needs to define what that support looks like at each level and who they're pulling, uh, who they're pulling entrepreneurs from and in what sectors, and then looking for the market resources to support those entrepreneurs at each stage. We are incredibly focused on co the corporate engagement component for our early stage entrepreneurs. We want to make sure that they are focusing their ideas and, and their business models on what the market needs, and even better yet, what the market will pay for, um, instead of spending a lot of time and a lot of resources on problems that don't actually exist. So I think that there are components that are similar um, like mentors are critical at every stage. Corporate engagement is critical at every stage. Um, motivators, you know, cheerleaders are, are critical at every stage. So it goes back to the idea that there are so many different skill sets that have relevance in supporting entrepreneurs and everyone has something to add. And the quicker that you can get buy-in from your community and all the different stakeholder groups that they have something to add, uh, the, the faster your community will scale and it's in its capacity to support, I think. Um, but it, for example, um, in, in Chattanooga, um, you mentioned the, course, the co-starters program. Um, we have co-starters graduates, actually not just in Chattanooga, but around the state and around the region, that are then accelerator cohort companies that are then part of our, at Launch Tennessee, our master accelerator program, that then might qualify for our startup village at our uh, regional national conference, 3686. Who, are then, uh, who then have become Insight Portfolio Companies, which was a state of Tennessee um, matching fund. So you start to see that continuum of care. And then I also think it's critical, particularly for those early stage entrepreneurs, when you're working with high school students and, and different demographics that don't necessarily see the runway, to be very purposeful about showing them what the runway is, that we're not just going to put you in a nine week class and push you out the door. There's additional support levels as you go. And yes, you'll get less hand-holding as you mature, but, you know, that's life, too. So. Does that speak to that I was wondering if there's any specific programs like Insight Portfolio Companies that I can't, we have so many programs that are very um, homegrown, if you will, and so the, the way that that is achieved in the different communities has been built there. There is a program that we came across about two years ago and have since licensed in a couple different formats, and it's out of the Connect organization that is in San Diego. They have what they call their springboard platform. And really what it is, instead of having a calendar-driven accelerator for a company, it's a much more milestone-driven program. So for companies that don't really fit the model of a 13-week boot camp, particularly if they're commercializing technologies and they can't rush what's growing in the Petri dish and that sort of thing. But really what it does is it, is, it can be post-accelerator support. So it's, dry, it's very customized to the company. Uh, it's very mentor-driven. And I think any program, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the name of a program besides Springboard, but I think any program that's gonna do its best in that space is going to be um, 
it's going to be milestone driven so that there are um, there's propelling forward. It's going to be mentor driven so that it stays relevant. You're going to have market connections to it, um, and you're going to have access to capital as some component of it. Are there any additional questions? Just to, just to make a comment, I'm great after with Appalachian Regional Commission. J just to uh, add to that last question, there are a number of people in the room here today who do a great job doing just what you're describing, helping companies post startup become very successful and get over that hump. So I think there's a, a number of folks who could respond to that all across the Appalachian region. So it's, it's a really a great group of, of folks here today. Anyone want to take a stab at it before we dismiss? Do I see a hand? I see Ray pointing to someone specifically. I thought in Ohio they do a nice job there, Jen. You want to? Yeah, I was getting her, her things down here at Crime Try and taking notes. Here is the question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the young lady I wanted some specific examples of programs that provide support post. Um, oh, post uh, startup, yes, thank you. Okay, okay. I, my apologies. I thought that's what she said. Specifically, growth oriented, growth -oriented companies. Growth oriented companies. Accelerators. Business that are established but want to grow. Yeah. So, we, at our innovation center, we um, typically, about in three years or so, we have people um, that, you know, we're, we're pushing out the door. But we work directly with our um, economic development organization at the state called Jobs Ohio. And um, an organization that is called uh, this is the third frontier, which is our tech more of our technology um, uh, driven initiative at the state to provide kind of that next level of services. If it's you know workforce, if it's next stage capital, um, the innovation center and our partner Tech Growth Ohio, which is also at Ohio University. We help make introductions to that next stage of capital, so it could be venture capital. Some people it might not be that high growth, you know. So, but we in the innovation store we have actually an um, uh, we actually have a venture capital firm located there, so that that helps. Uh, they've made introductions for our companies to others that are more in, in their um, I guess in their niche. Um, and, and I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, other than to say we don't just let people go out the door and then ignore them. Um, our community improvement corporation has put uh, done um, for forgivable. Uh, it wasn't a forgivable loan, excuse me. It was debt to equity um, that we put into a company. So now I serve on the board of a um, of one of our of one of our companies and. Uh, you know, the service that our community is providing, um, whether that's location, obviously we want to anchor people into our own communities, so we do a lot on, on, that, on that piece. We treat them like it's an attraction. I mean, we put more effort in keeping our companies in our communities than we do in attracting other companies. And so that's, um, I think that's the way all of our economic development offices are starting to go, in, to go and if they're not, they're dying. This concludes our um, first session for our investing in rural entrepreneurship.